Welcome to PLZ Soccer's football show on our YouTube channel. I'm Peter Martin, Alan Ruff and Tammy McManus are here with me. Thank you very much for your support. All you have to do is hit that subscribe button and become part of the football family. It's unbiased, it's unmatched and it's absolutely free. You'll get your opinion here on the show five days a week and over and above that if you download the app you'll get all the breaking stories right across the UK, Europe and globally as well as we count down to the World Cup. We're certainly looking forward to it. I'll be getting the thoughts of these guys. Please, if you can, tell us who you think is going to finish up with the trophy in their hands. Hi to Matt. Hi to Peter Ramsey. Um, we've also got Bartholomew, Mark and DPG. Uh, so it's, uh, and I quite like the line from DPG who says, God, them three again, um, because <laughs> clearly <laughs> there are some, there are some, <clears throat> you know, little mixes on the panel that people don't like Ruffy I mean you are always like but Tam and I I think are Marmite you know you either like us or you don't well I suppose you've got more of an outright opinion than me you know as you know I don't like to offend anybody yeah absolutely um, um, in the game, isn't it? absolutely and uh, you say you don't like to offend anybody we call it useless punditry then <laughs> why is he here Tam if you can't open that hard housewife's favourite yeah, yeah but as absolutely. soon as the housewives start dying out that's <laughs> That's exactly it. And we're getting He's mightily done. close to that, aren't we? <laughs> anyway, uh, by the way, well done today in your daily record column, uh, not just for writing, um, which is... <laughs> Which is, wasn't a, which is amazing in itself um, but uh, a nice tribute to, to Jimmy Earl Ruffy uh, paid a, a really fitting tribute yesterday yeah no listen I, I met him a few times when I was a player uh, and, and as I mentioned today in the paper I played in a charity game about four years ago uh, he was a coach of my team and Pat Stamp was a coach in the other team it was all ex Hibs players playing against each other and uh, I scored a hat trick in the game and I came off and he said why did you never do that in a Hibs jersey when you were playing uh, so I chuckled at that, and he was he was great fun actually. He was actually a really really nice guy. We've done the team talk and all that. He was very relaxed, and uh, I, I thought he came across a really nice person. And it was only four years ago, and he was in great shape and great spirits. Then, and just shows you how how quickly you know people can maybe deteriorate in that time. So, no, I really condolences to his family and the Hibs the Hibs support. You know, because by all accounts, Ruffy obviously knows him a lot better than me and seen him playing. But him and Alan Gordon, I think, uh, scored. You know, 50 or 60 goals one season. Uh, they were phenomenal, and he scored two back-to-back -back hat tricks in Europe. The only Hibs player to do that as well. So, one of, one of, one of Hibs' best players ever, I think. Yeah, absolutely. I don't think there's uh, anybody who's going to argue with you there, Tam. So, uh, and of course, uh, Ruffy, the, the other thing about it, we were at the Dukla Pumferson reunion, and uh, you know, of that magical side, it was great to see John Blackley and John Brownlee, wasn't it? Yeah, well, they they were part of Rookie's team. Uh, obviously, Rookie coming to the end of his his career but uh, they were they were a mainstay in that and uh, although we're talking about his family will obviously be, be feeling it a lot one person who will be feeling it is Pat Stanton yeah Pat Stanton and Ricky were so close they did everything together you know and obviously brought him on board when Pat was the manager at Hibs and uh, as I said yesterday he was essential to everything that was Hibs so no I think it'll be quite a sad moment at his funeral yeah absolutely um, we've got a quiz question we always like to uh, throw it out there uh, well done to uh, Kerry who came up with the question today uh, Tam so well she's done to, to Kerry grafting so yeah, that Adam doing it all the well, time she's grafting yeah, good. and she's uh, really really doing a great job for us Kerry which country has the youngest coach at the World Cup so there you are that's a good one which country has the youngest coach at the World Cup uh, give us your thoughts on it of all the coaches there who's the youngest are you hiding it well I'm hiding it from him because he <laughs> well, because he <laughs> Do you think I'm a chameleon? Do you think I'm a chameleon that can see through two goggles? No, but you always say, see it? But you usually do that. Yeah, you do that. You cheat all the time. I'm That's not I'm doing it. Anyway, um, we're staying with the World Cup as well. Uh, and obviously, we're going to talk a wee bit about Scotland. No real point in going in too deep about Scotland because the game kicks off at uh, five o'clock. And here's the team. Uh, Craig Gordon in goal, Andy Robertson's the captain, Scott McTominay, Grant Hanley, Kieran Tierney, John McGinn, Lyndon Dykes, Jack Hendry, Billy Gilmore, Stuart Armstrong and Ryan Fraser, which is a, which is a strong squad that he's had available for a friendly. Yeah, it's a really strong team actually. Um, I thought he might have gave other players a chance, which I would have preferred to be honest. I look at guys like, I don't know, maybe Liam Kelly, Lewis Ferguson in particular, who's doing really well at Bologna. Thought he might have got run out. Calvin Ramsey. Calvin Ramsey, right yeah. back. You know, you, know, you know what Tierney can do and Craig Gordon and... And guys like that, Billy Gilmer and McGinn. So I'm a bit disappointed that he's not gave you know 
fresh players a chance. Yeah, I agree with you. Um, so thank you to so many of you who are guessing on who, uh, which country has got the youngest coach at the World Cup. We'll give you the answer at the end of the program. Um, I think the one thing about the World Cup that I am looking forward to, of course, it's got a lot of negative uh, press. I'm going to talk about that, Rafi. But the one thing that I think we should all look forward to in some ways, and of course, Ronaldo is very much at the forefront of everybody's thoughts because of what he's done with that interview with Piers Morgan, is the fact that we will have, for the last chance, that opportunity to see two of the greatest players of the last generation going out there strutting their stuff on their final World Cup because I don't see the two of them coming back in four years. No, I don't think so either. I think this is it. You know, I think it's a chance for all young kids out there, you know, that uh, haven't seen many World Cups, you know, and to experience these two on show because they are something special. You know, there's no doubt about that. And I'm sure a lot of kids will be wanting their parents to buy jerseys when the World Cup's on. And I, I don't know, how many, many jerseys do you think would go more than the other? Then there'd be more kids want to buy a Messi ah, jersey I think than so. an Aldi jersey. I think more people would buy a Messi, but I, I think, despite the fact that a lot of people don't like Ronaldo at the moment, you know, there's a lot of people who are, you know, they've got their own opinion on him. I uh, personally think he's been a fabulous footballer, um, and I think once his career's over, a lot of people will reassess his contribution um, over the last 20 years. I think he's been absolutely sensational. If people don't like arrogant people or people are questioning why he came out and said what he said, they're perfectly entitled to be criti critical of him. Um, but I think his contribution as a footballer has been unbelievable. His professionalism in actually every year until he joined, uh, obviously in that final year, Manchester United, Tam, is, is really what I think has turned even more people against him. There's some people who don't like all the posturing, but... That's, you know, I, I think he's tainting, he's tainting his legacy. I think he really has in the last six months to a year. I think that uh, before that, his professionalism could never be called into question. Yeah. You know, fit every season, great pro. You know, but this season, first and foremost, walking out, you know, walking off before the game had finished when he never got on. I think that was that was hugely disappointing to see that from him. And then, obviously, still a minority player at the minute. He's in there and he's slotting the manager and he's slotting the chairman and the players. So. I think he's he's tainted it a little bit in the last in the last season for me. Well, I'll be honest with you. Um, there's a lot of things in the mix in this one, Ruffy, and the conduct of a club and their board and, and various things in the background. Um, I think need to be called into question at times as well. And I'm not De Ronaldo's lawyer. He doesn't need anybody to defend him. He's big enough and man enough. The one thing I would say is I was listening to some of the comments of Roy Keane about previous Manchester United players who were involved in all sorts of misdemeanors. And if you look over the last twenty years some legends can't hold their head up high. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if Ronaldo's uh, petulance is being viewed in a negative uh, way, so be it. He has to take it on the chin. I think his legacy, you know, w once he hangs up the boots, I think this little episode will be forgotten and you'll look back at a career filled with goals, filled with a guy who played late into his 30s because of his professionalism and look at his stats and I think it stands up there to be in the top five greatest <clears throat> players of all time. Yeah, I think when you're judging players, you should be judging them on the park. You know, these, these kind of things happen in football. We've all been there. We've all fell out with a manager. We've all fall, fallen out with somebody, you know. But you've got to, you know, have a wee bit of dignity. And I think it's just the here and now that everybody's going, oh, he's not behaved himself very well in the last six months. And that's fair enough. Because, I mean, there's a lot of times at clubs when it's not working for you, you don't like the way it's working. And let's forget, we, we were just ordinary players. He's a superstar. Yeah. You know, and, and everybody's different mentally how you handle things. I'll tell you another thing we'll miss, and uh, well done to Matt, who has actually highlighted it. It's a blow for this programme, Ruffy, um, when he eventually hangs up his boots, because we'll have no more CR7 pants to give away on the show, because... Uh, do you remember that day when you it's decided it would be a great idea to buy yeah. CR7 pants to give away? Yeah, I certainly do. <laughs> uh, and I certainly, uh, I've still got a pair of my own, so they might be going up for auction quite soon. Does, Ma does Maggie want you to wear them before you go to bed? <laughs> You're made. <laughs> Um, yeah, let's not go any further than that. But uh, uh, no, I don't think there'll be too many people want to buy your last pair, Ruffy. Um, but I think it's going to be great to see the two of them, Tam. I want Argentina to win it because I think it would be great for Messi to, to just get the ultimate honour for what a career he's had as well. Remember, Ronaldo's won the European Championships. 
I think if Messi wins it with Argentina, I think he would go down as the best player ever. I think that's the only thing he's missing. I know he's won a Copa America and people say that's a kind of big tournament over there, but in terms of Europe, in terms of yeah. his country, I think if he goes and lifts that World Cup like Maradona done, yeah. I think he's the best. The best player ever? Yes. I think it's the only in thing history. he's missing in history for me. Why, why, do, wow. why do you think we don't talk... Wow. Why, why, why is it wow? wow. <laughs> He's, he's the best player I've ever seen. Yeah. In my generation, anyway, he's the best player yeah. I've ever ah, seen. Ah, hey, don't move the goalpost, uh, boy. And you think all the, all the goals he scored, the, the, everything he's won, I just think the World Cup's just missing. If he, if he gets that, he's got the full set. Yeah. Why, why do you think we don't talk about him as much in Paris and what we did? Well, because nobody world. really cares about don't really watch, football. You don't really watch PSG on the TV. Have you ever yeah. watched French football, Ruffy? No, I haven't. No, you would think you would be doing something. I kind of get that. Here and there. I kind of get that sometimes on my, on on my the stick. Dish. Wow. On wow. my stick, sometimes it's a wee <coughs> thing. Some, um, somebody's blocking it. That's amazing, isn't it? Because usually <laughs> the satellite, the wife's up on the roof and she's moving the Russian satellite about. Um, <laughs> Probably the problem. <laughs> the thing's getting in the road. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I, uh, he's a bad man. He really oh is. My God. But I, I actually think, uh, I actually the reason why I'm saying, you know, it's a great shout. If Ronaldo, if uh, Messi wins the World Cup, is he the greatest player ever? Ha, you know, give us your thoughts on it. Is he the greatest player ever if he wins the World Cup? <laughs> I know somebody um, else won it more than once. Yeah, I know, but he's missing. <laughs> he's won everything. He's won everything. Yeah. And the one thing I would say is, Ruffy, which is a really strong case for it, is. I mean, he's won seven Ballon d'Ors. So, I mean, maybe one you could maybe contest that he shouldn't have won, but seven's some going, isn't it? And the Champions League games. I mean, I was lucky enough to be in Rome when he, you know, he was just brilliant uh, along with the rest of the Barcelona side against Man United. He's just... What he's done in European football at times has been mesmerising. It's unbelievable. Oh, for seven or eight years, it only was one or the other. Yeah. No, that's how... Eight, seven or eight, ten? Well, that, well that's how head and shoulders they were above everybody. You know, so and everybody would have a debate, a debate of which of one of the two should get it. And yeah. I think at that particular time, I think Messi was the one, because you've touched on it there. We saw more of him. Yeah. You know, on the telly and the things he used to do were, were just scary. Can you do me a favour, Ruffy? Um, we we've picked our greatest ever World Cup eleven. Um, obviously, Tam and I have put a bit of thought into it. Some people might dismantle our World Cup. He just copied mine. No, no, he didn't. No, I didn't. He didn't. I, made him a lot of them. I made a mistake. Oh, no, he's made a mistake. He's he about to explain mistake. it. One mistake. Right, explain your mistake. I forgot about Pele. <laughs> mistake is yeah. not that big. <laughs> right, okay. Talk us through your 11 then. Here's your 11 oh, rough. Right. right. I think you made another mistake, but fire away. Uh, it's off in goal. Uh -huh. uh, there isn't many goalkeepers. Why did you get Carlos at right back? I know that, but that's another mistake. I but... phoned him and that's where he wanted to go. <laughs> right. I like Carlos. I think he's obviously an overlapping fullback, scores goals. Fantastic. Brilliant. Right. Uh, Berezi, second to none defensively, if you ask anybody. Probably one of the hardest men in the, in the game, yeah, but also a quality football player. And I like the big man beside him because I think he's got a dig. He's got a bit of dig about him. And uh, when they played, yeah. I think when they played England just recently, and he, he was single-handedly took care of them as well. Yep. Maldini, fantastic. You know, probably the. You know who I was going to throw in. I mean, you he, haven't you haven't mentioned Chiellini's name because obviously you Chiellini. can't pronounce it. No, Chiellini. Chiellini. Chiellini's brother. Yeah, Chiellini. and Chiellini is still with an eye at the oh, back. Right. Uh, so, well, Maldini speaks for himself. Right. Quality player. Okay, top man. Yave, it was either Yave or Iniesta. And I went for Iniesta. Is Iniesta an ice cream man? <laughs> <laughs> what about Iniesta? I went for him because I couldn't pronounce his name. So I put Yavi. <laughs> but either of the two of them. Uh, Zidane for me is just. I saw a half hour clip of Zidane in one of the programmes and some of the skill that he's got is unbelievable. Yep. Platini is of my era. You yep. know, he used to go to World Cups ah, uh, and single handedly win it for for France most of the games and up front I think we all agree you know they are the three but I made a mistake and I'm on and not because of what we're talking about with Ronaldo yeah uh, I'm putting Pelly in there oh you can't put Pelly you put Ronaldo all oh, right well Ronaldo's in there I'll right. just have to live with it. Maradona and Messi mm -hmm. so it's not a bad one and by the way thanks to um, it's lots of people um, are looking here and saying Philip Lamb. Philip Lamb, I can't argue with that. He was absolutely brilliant. Um, Alan Wood says Maradona, still the best ever. Um, won, won the World Cup in an average Argentina team. Who's that? Um, this is oh, Alan, Maradona. Alan says Maradona. Maradona, and he says Pele had much better players around him. Um, mm. And Kate, there's an argument for that. Alan, hang fire, and I'll argue with you on it shortly. Um, 
Messi is a team player, says Mark Greaves. Ronaldo is not. Ronaldo just thinks about himself. Uh, that, yeah. Daniel says Pirlo better be in it. Daniel, I mean, it's just a... It's just on one of those great shouts. <coughs> Pirlo is a fantastic player. So many people um, have got this and looked at it. Uh, hi to Stuart McKinnon. We haven't actually spoken to Stuart for a while. He loves it. Hi, guys. Great. Free show. Doesn't get any Love better Sweden. than that. Well remembered, by the way. Yeah, Stuart's over there in Sweden. He's a Who's the guy who mentioned Philip Lamb? Uh, I don't, I don't know. Are you going to do a no, 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 no. Yeah. I'm not. I'm just waiting. I was going to put, him. I was going to put him in as well. I did think about a bit. Well, um, I thought love. I might get slaughtered. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> right. There right. You go. Give us your eleven. Right. Give it up right. Okay. I'll start with Buffon and goal. Dino's off. Obviously, a top keeper. But Buffon's my era, and I thought he was outstanding. Right. Cafu, right back. Wonderful player going forward. Played in a great Brazil team. Left back Maldini, same as Ruffy. I'm going to put Sergio Ramos in there Ooh. Uh, simply because his record in Champions Leagues is yeah. outstanding. And would you he's be won willing, everything with Spain. Would you be willing to play with 10 men midway through the second uh, half? Yeah. And he's got that bit of badness <laughs> about him, which I like in a centre half. Right. Uh, Baresi obviously speaks for himself. Yavi and Yesta Modric, I, think that, uh, I don't think that the other team would get the ball off of the three. I'm going to be honest with you. I think Such those a... three together would be spectacular. Uh, they would just keep the ball for fun. I'd play with two number 10s. I play with Maradona and Messi in behind the real Ronaldo for me. Yeah. The Brazilian Ronaldo. And I think that team there is unbeatable. Yeah. I have to tell you, Tom, uh, Xavi, Iniesta and Modric, that is a <laughs> good midfield, isn't it? They're too lightweight. You need a bit of dig in there. What happens when things so go he, against you? Are you going to put Terry Hullock in? No. You've got to have a Zidane. You've got to have a dig in there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'll tell you what, that's a good shout because Zidane yeah. was a nasty piece of work yeah, at the time. You've got to have that. You've got to, it's yeah. not going to go. They're not going to let you three yeah. get the ball and no. Well, no, D P G. Look at the ball off him. Hang, hang fire, hang fire. Um, by the way, Christopher Coyle says, Tam McManus, spot on with Ronaldo number nine, what a machine. Yeah. Um, and only one of us has, has actually met him here. Uh, also, uh, the I other one, <laughs> the other hand got his jersey. Um, Is that in, the, in the man cave? It's up the stairs, I'll keep it away from you. Um, also, I can just say here, DPG says, why no Lewandowski is striker? He's got to be worth a shout. I, I, I think you're right. Um, no, 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 caliber. It's, it's also, uh, Gregor, and I think this other one here, and I think this is where I really did, I was in a dilemma about this. Chris Andrews uh, and also Gregor have said Bobby Moore um, was fantastic. I you nearly know? had Bobby Moore. So it brings me nicely to explaining to you, here's my 11. Um, this team is absolutely brilliantly mental because <laughs> <laughs> because let me, let me explain it to you let me explain it as well well listen Schmeich Miller that plays in oh, oh, old oh, Miller no no let me tell you son the calm down Schmeichel. right so Schmeichel's in goal because you know we're talking about generations I loved Schmeichel I thought he was a great goalkeeper and I thought his ability to play handball helped him when he made those big stars saves he was brilliant um, I make mean, no bones about it I'm not going to lie to anyone one who's thinking oh wait a minute get a grip Peter but Danny McGrain is in at right back he was the world's best right back in 1974 and he was absolutely magnificent so if I'm taking it in the neck for him I don't care uh, left back Maldini I really roughy and I don't know if you've got a comment on this but I had Beckenbauer I can't believe you yeah. two never mentioned him uh, and I, I put Baresi in and that head of Bobby <coughs> Moore I really was toiling there because I thought about Bobby Moore strongly but I've gone for Baresi yep yeah it was the same uh, Bobby Moore did and anybody who watched that World Cup away back there uh, even the players he played against raved about him even yeah. Pelly thought he was the best Killini was a strange shout for Ruffy it was a strange shout actually anyway. especially when he spelt it yep. um, also uh, the I've got a diamond in the midfield I've gone Croy no, you've Cruyff. just randomly put all the nice players you no, like no, in no, no, I'll tell you why I'll tell you why because Cruyff <laughs> on and off the park was a genius right Cruyff could play Cruyff could easily have played midfield <clears throat> out in the wing, yeah. up front. He, he actually played in several positions, whether it be Barcelona, Feyenoord, Ajax, um, and, and he won you know, titles with these clubs. So Cruyff there, who would play just in front of that back four, take the ball off them, give it to Maradona, give it to Messi, and I've gone Pele just behind the front too. Pele is the greatest player ever. How many players at 17 years of age get selected, 17, get selected in one of the world's best sides at the time, and he's still in it, 
and scores two as a 17-year-old in a World Cup final, you need to have a long, hard look at yourself. The others, like Messi and Ronaldo, weren't anywhere near a World Cup final team at 17. And the last two I've picked, I was toiling with Ronaldo, but I've, I'll tell you what I've gone for, Ruffy. Marco van Basten was a sensational player. He gives me that little bit of height. Mm. And then... Gerd Müller of Bayern Munich. When I was growing up as a boy, if I had Gerd Müller's World Cup sticker, I would not be swapping it with anyone. What a goal-scoring record he has. There's my team. Dismantle it at your peril. Uh, that, uh, if you'd thrown Van Basten in there, uh, Hullet, no? Did you know that? No, Hullet, Van Basten. I'll get you that then. Van Basten then. was better than him. Can't have Danny McGrain in there. That was a great player. But hold, on a sec. <coughs> 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 hold on a sec. Hold on a sec. Wait a minute. Can't leave him. The reason it's a it's a great team. Cafu, but still won the World Cup. It's a very great team. Cafu in his pocket. Danny McGrain's good player. But the problem I've got with the team is obviously you're all you're going forward. You're winning most of the games. There's going to be a time when you're under pressure yes. and you're going to shout for the sides. Hey, Maradona and Messi, start backing up people. They're running by you there. <laughs> Get up. Oh by the way, my. can I just say to you, Ruffy, when somebody said to me in there, oh, your team looks fairly attacking. I said yes, and I said when we don't have the ball, we're in trouble. But thankfully, McGrady and Maldini were just short it all up they were that good um, but uh, to be fair Ruffy I think once we'd gone 9 nothing ahead we'd just start to defend our lead oh it'd be great games oh. it'd be high scoring games as I'm well. bashing in before Brazilian Ronaldo yeah. Ian Dockery's just said Peter has 6 strikers on the park <laughs> I know and that's why people are flocking to see the games that I'm selecting it's incredible entertainment Tam isn't that's it that's why we get pumped at the fives <laughs> <laughs> Ruffy's he picked the team um, <laughs> and Gregor says McGrain was injured for Argentina 78 yeah. yes but they were still contemplating playing him he was that good oh, he was de definitely good enough definitely oh, good in that high level God almighty Ruffy give him the chance uh, give him the chance he could have played for most of the teams that they were all playing for in Europe I kid you not Ruffy he played 74 he played 82 he would easily have been selected for 78 if he hadn't yeah. I think it was diabetes and a fractured skull yeah, yeah. so he played in two World Cups Danny McGrain Danny was, yeah. Two. And you played in what? Three? Three. No, I was at three. I only played in two. So it was absolutely magnificent. But, just, um, and by the way, World Cups are just a gag. Can I just say something to you? Matt's laughing about McGrain. Matt, you're, you know, and I know you're a Rangers fan, Matt, um, and it's all about opinions. Um, Matt, I don't care. McGrain's in. It's as simple as that. And also, Peter Ramsey says, eh, Ruffy, mm -hmm. you need to have a long, hard look at yourself. <laughs> you forgot Zico. Quite rightly as well. I don't, want him, I don't want him anywhere near me. Yeah, absolutely. That's your man. That's your man. Um, and uh, lots of people have uh, their own thoughts on it. Listen, that's that's is. Who do you think would win out of the three teams? I bet you the majority say mine. Uh, what? Not a chance. You're, 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 you've not got a hope. When I get the ball, Javi, Javi and Nesta Modric. When I get the ball from. Yeah, yeah. Tom, do you know the great thing about those three teams? Yours would finish a gallant third. Um, but uh, no Carlos Albo Alberto says Ian Vaz. Ian, that's the thing about it. You could, <coughs> you could pick a team and you'd think, you know, um, I'm sure there are some. And Ian Docherty says, I have to say, McGrain was world class. I kid you not. Uh, it's not fair for Tom, he didn't see him. But McGrain was world class. I would say Danny was world class. But I'll tell you what, Sandy Jarden wasn't far behind him. Not. I don't mean miles behind them, but in a mention, you would have to mention them. Sandy Jarden. Yeah, yeah. I agree with you. I love Sandy as a person as well. Um, Sandy was a great player. Um, but I think Danny was just a, a, a wee level above everything we had, uh, and certainly in a world stage, definitely. Blackadder, I think, deserves a special mention because he did say, what about Ronaldinho? I mean, Ronaldinho was mm. magnificent, wasn't he? I mean, he was a real star. He's the only guy I've Most seen. famous for lobbing semen. Well, not only that, but he, he made a pass with his back. Mm. I mean, he passed the ball with his back one night in the new Camp, Ruffy. How many people do that? Um, OK, uh, England have arrived there. I don't think they're going to win. I, don't worry, I got the gag, Ruffy, it's fine. Um, I don't think they're going to win the World Cup, uh, unless you're about to tell me differently. I think there's something like 19 to, to 1. But the England fans arrived um, in Qatar, uh, and as you can see, you know, everybody excited about it there's lots of uh, fans uh, <laughs> I mean, I mean uh, by the way can I just say something you might laugh right but the, the Qatar the Qatar FA um, have actually um, put out a, a statement um, basically saying that um, 
you know, that the, the, there's some suggestion, Ruffy, that there are some people um, who've been paid <clears throat> to appear as fans at various venues because there's not a lot of people there. Well, um, I'm sure Hugh McDonald will keep us up to scratch. I think Hugh's going over there, early doors. He'll let us know, yes, you know right. all about what's happening there. I, yeah. I really I really hope they've got fan zones and orga organised because that's when most of the trouble starts when there's people just roaming about yeah. bars the, or everything. The Qatar um, PR uh, department <coughs> for FIFA says numerous journalists and commentators on social media have questioned whether there are real fans um, we thoroughly reject these assertions, which are both disappointing and unsurprising. Qatar and the rest of the world is comprised of a di diverse range of football fans, many of whom share emotional connections with multiple nations. Well, that is absolutely... Pff, listen, I want to see lots of different fans there. I don't care, you know, what flag they're wa waving. The biggest problem I have with the whole situation over there in Qatar is, as many journalists have highlighted... Um, is the migrant workers, the conditions they had in the build-up, <coughs> the attitude of the Qatar nation to gay and lesbian people. And, and I think there's a lot of people have highlighted, and I think rightly so, Tam, that you have a country which has had a huge death rate for people building the stadiums. Yeah. You know, some people are questioning the 6,500 figure, but there's also a number of, and a high figure, uh, and I read an article yesterday, a figure of 15,000 unexplained deaths. Now, I, I don't care what way you talk about it, there's no such a thing as sporting integrity. That, because FIFA, to me, are symptomatic of so many people where money's involved. Greed overcomes any moral high ground. Yeah, I, I don't, I don't the, think the, I don't think the World Cup should be there, Peter. I really don't. I no. don't think the World Cup should be there. It's there for one reason, you know, money. Russia, 2018, money. You know, Seth Blatter, we all know, likes an envelope. And I think that... Um, well, can I tell you something? I, I'm going to caution you there because at the end of the day, you know, Seth Blatter and many others, um, you know, Seth Blatter, I think, has fallen foul of his position there as the head of FIFA at the time because a number of people, um, I think, were under investigation for various things. I certainly don't want PLZ Soccer to mm. suddenly get a letter from Sepp Blatter's lawyer. Um, but he failed as as a, he failed as the, the president of FIFA for me for a number of reasons, which eventually um, cost him his job. Um, but I thought with Gianni Infantino coming in, there might have been a fresh approach to it. But instead, what we've got is a PR sweep across saying, let's just think about the football. And now Infantino's come out and said, you know, this may well, it, we'd love it to lead to, um, you know, a, you know a, a period of time where Russia and, you know, and Ukraine stopped the war. I mean, it's just a lot of nonsense. It's a lot of nonsense to try and paint <coughs> the football in a positive light in a country which I think is open to a huge amount of criticism for their human rights issues. And and by the way, football greed, as Tam mentioned, that's at the forefront of it. Yeah, I, th I think the biggest the biggest one of the all that you're talking about is obviously the deaths that happened to the... And I, I thought FIFA, with the amount of money that they have, should have went way out of their way to compensate, you know, the people who'd lost their lives. Set up a fund, set up something, seemed to be active and taking responsibility for what had happened. The other stuff will go on for years and years and years. There's nothing we can do about that. But uh, I think they should have went out of their way to get some kind of good PR before the football actually starts. Yeah. Um, Patrick McLaughlin says, um, I'm going to give you my team. And Patrick, you know, that's the joy of this programme. It's a football programme. He says, my team would have been Schumacher, uh, Schumacher, yeah, um, the German, uh, Cafu, Beckenbar, Maldini, Roberto Carlos, Zidane, Xavi, Platini, Jarzinho, there's a name, Maradona and Cruyff. Jarzinho, mm -hmm. never thought about him, by the way, Ruffy. He was a great player on the 1970s side. Yeah, there's, there's tons of players throughout the years, you know, then it depends what era you're in and which ones tick the boxes. But uh, certainly, I mean, everybody, I mean, Tom's a lot younger than us, you know, and we're remembering that uh, team with Jerzan and all them in it. And it's, 
Uh, we're just a wonderful side to watch. Yeah, I love. Do you know why I love you, Ruffy? I've been with you ten years. Get that name right as well. Name. <laughs> 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 no. Is it him? Gerson. Gerson. That's not bad. Gerson. Gerson's not bad. By the way, by the way, uh, I, I think it's a good point here from Martin Torres uh, or Martin. <laughs> We're all, got, we're all at it now. Martin Torrens, who, who says, I'm surprised, Peter, you haven't got Doug Leash in there. I mean, honestly. You I must mean, have thought of it. See, oh, <laughs> absolutely, I thought of it. But I can't. I think they're all on the bench. <laughs> <laughs> I've got You're talking about some, some, some of the Brazilian players. What about Romario and Rivaldo? Oh, guys like yeah, that. Rivaldo is some player. Yeah, and by the way, I, I, I spotted, uh, it was really sad to see him because I've, uh, I've had the good fortune of interviewing him as well, but. Gascoigne was magnificent. Oof. I mean, Gaza was sensational. Jinky, brilliant, you know. Um, but we haven't mentioned them. There's so many great players that you could mention. Of course, some people would say, if you go further back, there's a there's a group of people who would say, what about Alfredo Di Stefano, Puskas? You know? Eusebio. Yep, Eusebio, the Black Pearl, that's what he was known as. He was a great player. And uh, let's not forget Bobby Charlton. So there's lots of great ones. And thank you for everybody. And Errol Campbell says Jimmy Johnson would have walked into any of those teams. I don't think too many people are going to disagree with you, to be honest with you. But nevertheless, it's all about opinion. It's all about somebody that's in your generation, Ruffy, isn't yep. it? You yeah, know? it certainly is. Good. I mean, every time we mention Pele, you know, Tam quite rightly... I'd never seen as, as much of him as what we did. So he's of the Messi, Maradona, the, the, the modern day. But if you get a chance to watch any, any of these documentaries that come up, any yeah. of the players that we've picked, they're, they're just a way above everybody. Absolutely. Um, you know, when people rave about <coughs> um, Beckham hitting one from the, the halfway line against Wimbledon, um, you know, it hits the back of the net and it was rightly lauded uh, from everyone for a young Beckham scoring that goal and arriving on the scene. Um, Ruffy and I, <laughs> the Czechoslovakian goalkeeper, oh, the Czechoslovakian that. goalkeeper <laughs> kicks the ball out <laughs> and Belly from the halfway line volleys it back up. <laughs> and by the way, the Czechoslovakian goalkeeper has to change his shorts because he can't believe somebody's <laughs> thought about it. I Never mind keeping <coughs> him, volleying him from the halfway line, Ruffy. I, I thought that the one after that was even better. You're a guy. Was it he squared the ball across? Cross, no, and, like, he, oh, and he just he, left it. Yeah, he, I yeah, mean, it's just that, brilliant. Yeah. He dummies the goalkeeper, and then <laughs> uh, I wanted that to get in, yeah. Ruffy. Did you? Yeah. Uh, Pelly was magnificent. We're going to do a mid term report on your favourite team. The bot we've been talking about it all this week the bottom six, then the top six. We've given them a, a school mark, Ruffy, as well. Um, so, uh, we're going to look at that shortly, but just quickly, uh, Celtic are in Australia, and I think the big news for a lot of Celtic fans who will be happy about it, Callum McGregor back in training. I mean, the footage uh, to see Callum McGregor there is is something that will please everyone, uh, not only Celtic fans, but Scotland fans. No, I think that's tremendous that he's, he's obviously back in, in training. I think that uh, there was a, a big fear that he could have been out for a long time, an injury. You know, to see him back is brilliant. I think he's, I think he's a vital for Celtic. I think he's the beating heart of that team. So, I think for him to go over there, you know, get some training in before before the the, the break commences again. So, I think that uh, I think that's terrific news for everyone at Celtic, and it just adds to more competition for places. Uh, are you surprised that there's the story gathering pace now that they're looking at offers for Juranovic in the January window? No, I did say that. I did say that in the show uh, two or three weeks ago. I was mean, <coughs> a bit disappointed with him this season. I thought last season. But he looked to business this season, not as good. And I'm not surprised at that. I think if he, if he has a good World Cup, I think Celtic might decide to cash in on him. Yep. Um, and as far as the, uh, I think, euphoria is the best way to describe it for a lot of Australian uh, fans who support Celtic because of Ange Postecoglou. Well, Ange Postecoglou is uh, back there with quite a strong lineup uh, to play in this Australian tournament and he's delighted to be back home. I know how important it is, obviously, again, growing up here, I um, always look forward to clubs from overseas coming over here and, um, you know, if, if I wasn't bringing the team over, I'd be going to the game tomorrow night. So, um, yeah, pretty proud to bring him back and, like I said, really important for me that we give a good account of ourselves because I know we've had tremendous support, um, not just the last couple of years I've been there, but the club's always had great support here. So, um I know how important it is for, for our supporters and the Australian football public and sporting public to see um, the guys up and close. Yeah, of course, spotted Harry Kuehl in the back. What a backdrop, Ruffy. What, yeah, yeah. what about that for a backdrop? Yeah, it's fantastic. Uh, I only had a chance to go to Argentina, eh, sorry, Australia once. was in Melbourne 
and I can appreciate what he's talking about. There are Rangers and Celtic supporters everywhere in the world, but Australia in particular, you know, they're, they're fantastic supporters of these clubs. Yeah, uh, Ange Postacoglu is going to be inducted into the Australia Football <coughs> Hall of Fame later in the week, so it's one of those, uh, I think, a trip filled with nostalgia. Certainly, uh, you know, no matter how many weeks we've looked at the back pages, they've linked Ange Postacoglu with every job. I mean, the Japan, Japan job is the job, latest yeah. one. But as I said to you before, and I, and I stick to my guns on it, having spoken to him on a couple of occasions, I, I firmly get the belief that three years minimum is where he'll be in charge of Celtic because he believes that he's got a job to do. Yeah, I don't think he's hit his ceiling so far at Celtic. I think there will be a point where maybe that comes... You know, in, in the future, I think Brendan Rodgers, you know, maybe thought he'd hit his ceiling and he moved on to England. So I don't think that that Andrew's near that yet. Yeah, I think he's he's got to, he's got to dominate domestically. He's got to win everything. The treble, there's a great chance of that this season for me for Celtic. He's got to make inroads in the Champions League, which I think he can next season. You know, I don't think they were a million miles away this season. I think if they can get another three or four better players in, and in key positions, then I think next season, with with a fortunate draw, they can they can maybe push for that second spot again. So. I think he's got plenty to do at Celtic, <clears throat> and I think he's still got you know still got a season or two uh, in Glasgow before he'd maybe cast his eyes down south. Okay, um, let's switch our attention to the, the domestic scene is is I think at this moment obviously uh, finished for a wee break for the World Cup and rightly so I think we all agree, Ruffy. There's a chance really for a lot of people to focus on the Championship. I know we are sending our reporter Adam out to your big game at the weekend, Partick Thistle, against our broth. Um, so uh, is the manager under pressure or is it just a case of... Well, he said he's under pressure last week uh, yeah. and, and that's what most managers would say when they're on that, that kind of run. But uh, most managers know the only way they can turn it around is to, to win games. Uh, fortunately, I think we'll have two or three or players back that have been missing for all these games, so hopefully that might make a difference. Yeah, our reporter's going to, so he'll be in the press room. What time uh, is Tam and I turning up for the... These are very welcome to c come to hospitality, any home game. Yeah, this one? If you want to come to this one, you have to let me know, because I have to put your names right. in the yeah. guest list. And the so you'll we'll be your guest, Alan? You will be my guest, yeah. Well, in the Alan Ruff Lounge? You no, know, you'll be in the boardroom for the free hospitality. It's good, by the way. Yeah, it's good. drinking food and everything. Always feel a wee bit uneasy going into a boardroom, but this one, because Dick Campbell and the <coughs> boys will be there as well, you know, be yep. a good chance to... Yeah, it'd be good to speak to Dick about, the, about how he's went about his victory that day. Yeah, absolutely, it would be really good. Um, good day. Good. <laughs> That'd be good, actually. Good to speak to you, uh, Dickie and give us a wee kind of a twenty-five, thirty minutes on what he's won. It's, it's, it's two. It's two. Yeah, it's, it's, it's two managers and and, and Dick and Ian that are, that are probably lacking a bit of confidence. So you'd maybe get me again there and give them a wee bit. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, do you fancy it? Yep. That's good. Well, Saturday. That's something sorted out for Saturday. Um, Mid-season report card. What about the bottom six? Um, this is this is our assessment of uh, what's happened in the bottom half of the Scottish Premiership. As we break for five weeks for the World Cup, let's have a look at how your team is doing in the Scottish Premiership, starting with the bottom six. At the foot of the table, being awarded a D minus, Dundee United. Jack Ross adopted a recruitment strategy of high-profile signings such as Stephen Fletcher to play alongside Scottish Premiership starlets such as Charlie Mulgrew and Tony Watt. It looked to be paying off as the season started with a stunning 1-0 win at home to AZ Alkmaar. The return leg, however, saw the Terrors annihilated 7-0 which lit the touch paper on a burning wreck of a season thus far. A 9-0 home defeat to Celtic saw Ross axed with the inexperienced Liam Fox brought in. The new boss had had few highlights, but a recent 4-0 win over Kilmarnock shows that perhaps muscle memory from their older stars might pull them from the rubble. Next up, Kilmarnock, who have been rewarded a D. It's easy to forget that Kilmarnock are the newly promoted side, given they are such a household name in the top flight. Kyle Lafferty's band controversy did nothing to aid an already rocking ship, but the emergence of Danny Armstrong as a constant creative threat does prove a bright spark. Adding more goals in January should be top of McInnes' shopping list with only 12 scored so far, the lowest in the division. Next we have Ross County on a C-. Malcolm Mackay knew he was in a relegation battle after picking up 8 points in their opening 10 league games. However, 2 wins out of 3 coming into the break have given the Staggies fans a shoot of hope for the second half of the season. George Harmon looks to be developing into a good option at fullback, whilst Jordan White provides a vital goal threat. In ninth position, Motherwell, who have been given a C. Motherwell come into the break with a dismal record of one win in eight games. 
Stephen Hamill said, have been decimated with injuries at various points since August, but the loan of former Academy product Stuart McKinstry has kept optimism high at Fir Park. Kevin Van Veen has bagged seven goals in 15 games, but there will be added pressure on the rest of the team to share the goals around. Coming in at 8th, Hibernian, who are on a C-. Hibs come into the season optimistically aiming for third under new manager Lee Johnson. However, the manager has repeatedly pointed to a wave of injuries that leaves the Leith side languishing in 8th. Results will have to improve quickly if Johnson is to see out the season in the Easter Road hot seat. And just missing out in a place in the top 6, St Mirren, who are on a B+. The fact St Mirren will feel disappointed not to be in the top 6 at the break is testament to the job Stephen Robinson has done so far this season. With four points out of six against the old firm at home and their first player ever heading to the World Cup in Keanu Bacchus, the future looks bright for the buddies. I think that's a fair assessment yeah, from Kerry. Yeah, I would agree with that. If, if, a, if the team she went through there, I think she was pretty fair in everything she did uh, with the marks. So yeah, it'll be interesting to see what the top six say. Yeah, absolutely. We'll get that tomorrow. But I think this is a good point here that Malcolm Mackay highlighted. I'm going to read it out to you, Tam, and see if you can give us your thoughts on it. Because not a lot of people are aware that uh, we've had to rebuild again in the summer. We lost 12 players in the summer and we can't do that every year. You cannot build a team every year. We've lost 24 goals as well. So we knew that this start of the season was going to be tough again in a Premier League that's probably even better than it was last year. Uh, with new players coming in from all over the globe and trying to settle into what is a very, very intense league, uh, that is taking time and it's always going to take time. It's a very good point that Malky makes and a lot of people <coughs> probably up here because of the nature of the finances don't take into consideration you're constantly having to take loan players who go back, mm -hmm. players that you're trying and gambling on who maybe you're not paying a transfer fee for but you're giving them weekly wage. Some of them work, some of them don't. Yeah, I think he's, he's, he's spot on there, particularly when you're in Dingwall. You're, you're, you're away up north and you're getting guys from maybe Premier League clubs in England. You can only get them for a season, you know, or maybe lower leagues England. You know, get them for a season, put them in a shop window. These guys don't want to come up and sign three and four year contracts. You know, the club have not got the finance to do that either. So he's totally correct there. I think Hungbo and, and Charles Regan Cook were the two big ones that they lost in the summer. Um, and those guys were, were very, very hard to replace so they, those goals. And I think when you look at Livingston as well, Livingston in a similar boat, and I think they've got to give <coughs> David Martindale an enormous credit for that because he's in the same boat as Malky. They give it a year, a year deal, you know, and, and if it's a wee bit of a risk on both sides. If the player does really well, then he's going to move somewhere else. And if he doesn't, then Livingston get, can get rid of him. They don't have to, to pay up his contract. So I think when you look at guys like like Mackay and, and David Martindale in particular, you've got to give them enormous credit for keep churning out competitive teams every season. Yeah, I think that's the key to it. If you look at Ross County, Ruffy, in the three seasons at Ross County, 19-20, they had 15 players in, 13 out. Next season, 15 players in, 12 players out. And this uh, season here... 10 players in, 12 players out. That's you, that's you no. completely changing the score. No, I think Malky uh, sussed that out as soon as he went there. And, and it's been Ross County's failing for the last uh, three or four years when they, they, they have that panic moment in January when all of a sudden 10 players come in. You know, but it, as you guys have just said, there are 10 of the guys probably leave at the end of the season. So then you've got to start again and you think you've got a, a reasonable pool. And then things don't go well, you're down the bottom of the league and then there's a the panic set in again, let's bring in another 10. And sometimes you get away with it, Tam's touched on it, they get two really quality ones last year. But there's, there's no like looking into the future, there's no bringing any young players in and bedding them in for a year or two. And I'm sure Malky would want to do that, but you've got to get the right players. Yeah. Are they going to stay for two or three years? Which is rightly what he points out. I mean, when you think about <coughs> what Livingston have, have achieved under Martindale, mm -hmm. the football that they've played and the type of player that they brought in and said, OK, some of them are journeymen, stay here a couple of years, just give us, give us that little bit of experience and then we'll throw in a few that we've managed to nab that nobody's heard of along the way. And then when you can get players of the calibre of Nicky Devlin, you know, who, uh, again, I think is, you know, an unsung hero for that team. You've got a, you've got a good mix there. Yeah, and it's been very noticeable, particularly at Livingston, that good players are getting pinched. 
No, the, the, there are other clubs in the S, SPL are identifying their better players and obviously they get offered better money elsewhere and they, they leave and they go to Motherwell or, or, or wherever. So he's got to start again, but that some of the players that they've brought in have, have been quite exciting. Yeah, and at the top end, you know, we're talking about the bottom <coughs> end here, uh, trying to switch their squads about. But at the top end, you've got Lee Johnson, you know, you've got Lee Johnson talking about it just in the mid table there about he needs five transfer windows. You've got the Giovanni Van Bronckhurst, who, by all accounts, the board are going to stick with him, has to contemplate in that January window, you know, maybe losing a couple of quality players, but there has to be an overhaul of that squad too. It's an ageing squad as oh, well. Starting off with the Rangers squad, I think that needs a, a, a major overhaul. I don't think they're going to be able to do it all in one window, but I think in January. You know, for me, Morelos, I'd get rid of him. I'd get rid of him. I've seen a picture today. I don't know, you know he's off, but he's sitting having a drink, you know, abroad. And that, that for me, is, is the difference between Celtic away training hard and, and Rangers giving their players time off and they're nine points behind. I don't, I don't understand that. And it's, it's a bit like Dubai when, when Neil Lennon took the players away, that picture. And I've seen that Morelos picture. I know a lot of Rangers fans wouldn't like that today. You see that picture, um, sitting, sitting having a drink. So... I think that Rangers need to they need to get more hungry players <coughs> in, in the window, and uh, they need to get rid of the ones that's underachieving. And it might just be that this window and the end of the season window they can get five or six out and five or six in because I think the league's done this season, and I think they're playing for for the two trophies. But I think that the, the major overhaul has to start in this window, and it's got to be the next couple of windows where the overhaul the complete squad. Because you're right, mm -hmm. as an aging as an aging team. Yeah, I didn't think they were going to sack Gio, did you? I thought there must have been a moment, you know, but obviously they have to assess, you know, we, the first thing we all see is uh, how many bonus points has he got in the bank, yeah. you know, and obviously winning the league and taking to Europe, you, there has to be a bit of loyalty somewhere, obviously they know, they have to assess the unrest and the, the Rangers fans, but uh, I think for, for the manager and the board, it's up to them to change it, so the pressure's now on them, I'm, I'm just surprised he's not tapped into the, the Dutch market. Now, generally, you get a manager going into a club, and he might identify maybe a couple of players yeah. that uh, he can go and look at. And, and certainly, Holland have got a few, you know, young players who keep breaking through into that national side. So it'll be interesting to see which way he goes down. Stephen Gerrard tapped into the English market, you know, because he had a lot of down there. So I, I think he needs to bring some kind of different kind of player to Rangers. And interestingly enough, Tom, when you looked at the the financial figures that were coming out for Rangers. And the next set will have the sale of Joe Aribo and Calvin Bassey. But it'll be interesting to see what type of money they get. I mean, there was already I read an article today saying that Glenn Kamara's uh, transfer value has plummeted. So is Morelos. So is Kent. You know, you're looking, you're saying to yourself, OK, if they are going to turn it around, they are obviously going to try and bolster any financial figures with the sale of players. That's what they were trumpeting over the last couple of years, that suddenly they had... Some players that not only went on to win the league, but players that suddenly were attracting interest from elsewhere. It, it's it's a never diminishing pool that they've got of players that you would <coughs> think was going to get top drawer. The current squad, yeah, I don't think there's there's any, if any, that's going to get big money in this current squad. Um, I think they 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 they've done the right business. They sold at the right time. You know, Aribo and Bassi, they got top dollar for them. But both of them were played in a, in a in a team that got a European final, and they were getting you know great exposure. In the European scene, big clubs watching them, you know, English teams in the Premier League looking at them, Ajax obviously as well. So, but I don't see it this season. I think that if you're looking at a team that's struggling, you know, they're struggling in the league. They were terrible in the Champions League. I don't think that there's going to be scouts looking at that and going, we'll take any of their players. I don't think they would take any Rangers players at the minute. Yeah, uh, and of course, uh, you know, you're looking, you're balancing the books, you're trying to build a team. Um, will you do it with the manager or are you paying off all his staff and getting something new in the summer? That's another big dilemma. And over and above that, have you got enough of a positive spin to get Rangers fans buying um, the you know buying the season tickets and the merchandise in big numbers? Um, Hugh Scott says, Peter, the value of players is only high if they're playing well. And Morelos, Kent and Kamara haven't kicked a ball this season. And I think that's the... I think that's the problem. I know Hugh um, makes uh, you know some really good points from time to time uh, about this whole situation. Um, John says what Rangers players are actually worth buying, which again backs up what uh, Tam is saying. And Andy, 
puts a counterpoint. I'm going to read this <coughs> out. He says, Tam's wrong. You don't think Lowry or King would attract big money? Well, they not might. In the no, no, not in the minute. No, I was going to say, King, Lowry's fit and can't get a game. Lowry, Lowry's quality. You know, I worked with Alex at... Obviously, with SF8 Bradhurst, he's a quality player, but he's he's not worth anything now. He's not playing. No, you need a hundred. If you get him in the team and he's, he, he has a couple of good seasons and he's, he could be worth a few million pounds, but yeah. the same with Boy King, you know, he, we're, we're all trumpeting. I, I don't think he's been that great, but I think he is a, he's a talented player. His height maybe go against him a wee bit as a centre back. Yeah, can I, I think can I put a, a bit of defence in for him? If you if you are Leon King and you are going into the baptism that, of fire into that Rangers side, you know you're thinking yeah. to yourself a team that's not playing well. You like to go through a learning curve. I mean, some players can you imagine going into a Rangers side and you get a few games and you're playing alongside Richard Goff? You're thinking, oh, f happy days, teams winning. I get to learn how to play the game, how to play the position. This guy's in there with James Sands, who's not a centre back, as we all know, and 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 it's like. This is, this is trying to defuse bombs in a team that can't win games. No, you're just going to hope that this is one for the future. This is one that he's going to learn all the experience of, of where they are now and where he is just now. And you would think in three or four years when they, they've got better players there and, and he will always establish himself through this experience that he's had of playing in Europe. James makes a point that I was just about to make, and I think it's a good one. Patterson didn't play, but he got a big transfer. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Um, I think... Nathan Patterson was one of those situations where I would love to have seen him getting 50 to 100 games for Rangers. James Tavernier was there. They thought, great, we can make some money off him. People knew the potential of him. Everton decided to buy. Yeah, but again... I Not think, many of them, though. No, but I think the Rangers got the maximum money for him. You know, he's a very, very talented young player. And he might go to Everton and do really well. But I think that when he played 30, 40 games for Rangers and they were getting 8 to 10 million for him, I think Rangers had to sell him at that point. You know, and he wasn't a regular. You know, Tavernier is your, your first choice right back. So I think that was a bit of bonus money for Rangers, you know, bringing a young player through and getting that type of money for him. But I don't think that, no, no offence to Lowry and King, I don't think they are in that, that kind of calibre at the minute. They've not played enough. They've not played enough. No, absolutely not. And I think uh, you start to also. Um, you start to also gain an attention if you're in a winning team as well that's producing results, Rafi. Is that Playing fair? in Europe as well. Yeah, yeah, playing in Europe and you're a standout. You just have to look at Bassey. You know, I know Bassey had a good European campaign, but the, the standout for him was the final. And somebody somewhere has said, right, that's the kind of player we want. Yeah, Tom Crossan says, Peter never quotes me. Um, you need to say... <laughs> <laughs> you need to say something, Tom. Then we'll quote you. <laughs> have I missed something along the way? And by the way, Tom, oh, just God. in just in case you haven't grasped it, I am asking these guys questions. I've got a script that I've written earlier on. Meanwhile, I'm trying to read a feed that's going at 100 miles an hour with people. Obviously, perfectly. I remember sending the show <laughs> one day, and this guy came on and went. All you do is talk about Rangers and Celtic. Rangers and Celtic. Every day it's Rangers and Celtic. And I said to him, but what team do you support? And he went, Motherwell. Well, what have you got to say about Motherwell? Uh, nothing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Listen, I, I'll tell you one thing, a hand in heart. I think the good thing about it from our point of view is we do cover all the teams as much as possible. And um, if we had the budget, I can tell you, if we had the budget of others, um, <clears throat> we'd have more than a few reporters out at every ground. But I have to tell you, Ruffy, mm -hmm. more than a few reporters in the new, yes. the, in the new um, year mm -hmm. going out to all the grounds. You know, there's lots of things happening, Ruffy. It's exciting. And we're going to be giving away some fantastic prizes as well, Ruffy. Uh, without even, you know, I'm not in any way dismissing your gloves signed, but I'm <laughs> 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 but there are there are some yeah. other, I think, Better. equally as good yeah. prizes. Well, I, have, I have looked at my two uh, freebies we got from Seville and from Manchester. Are you giving them away? I'm going to bring them in and give For Christmas? somebody a chance to look at the... They're only... What would you describe them as? Oh, so it, it's, it's, a, it's the, the, it's the it's media... It's the build-up of it, the media it, pack. It's the media pack where you get the programme... All the players... And you get and the stats... Never, but can I just say something to you, Rafi? I know you might think, you know, oh, there you are, you're just giving away something that's not a really good prize. It is a good prize, Tom, to get the whole media pack mm -hmm. and the, the programme in it <clears> is something that down through the years, you know, when people actually put them up for auction, they'll be good in mm -hmm. years to come. Can you imagine... Imagine someone who had the media pack 
from if there was one, if there was such a thing at that time. The media pact from 1967 and 1972. Imagine there was a media pact for Rangers against Moscow Dynamo or Aberdeen Real Madrid, big money now. Celtic Inter Milan. Jeez, the I'm programme. Maybe I'm being a bit hasty here. <laughs> <laughs> the, the programme alone for uh, some of the memorabilia from, uh, you know, uh, Gothenburg, um, from Celtic in '67. I think that's a hundred. You, you could pay 150, 200 quid for the for one of the original programmes from uh, Lisbon. Do you know I've still got a, an, int- an intact ticket for Celtic v Porto in the Seville? Yeah, because I had two tickets. Over to Larson, my ex teammate gave me two tickets, and the person I'd give them away to two Celtic supporters, and one of them couldn't go to the last minute, fell ill, and he couldn't get it away. So I've still got it in my house, the full yeah. ticket. Yeah. Is that worth any money now? Yeah, I've got one too, Tom. Don't, the not, full ticket? Really, yep. Not I'm, unused? Uh, yeah. Right. And I've also got the unused 1967 Celtic Inter Milan ticket. Ticket? Not the stub still on it. How good is that? Signed by, give me a name. Jimmy Johnson. Somebody would, Jimmy Johnson would be great. But give me another one. I like Neil. That'll do. That's all right, isn't it? Yeah, when are you selling that? Uh, probably just when the daughter hits university. <laughs> <laughs> is that fair? <laughs> <laughs> That's a bit it, rough here. Yeah, it shell, isn't it? Is, yep. Then she's uh, once they start saying they want an electric car, then you start sweating uncontrollably. Um, okay, a couple of things just to uh, mention. <laughs> Do you, uh, Tom Cross says I support Mother. Well, Tom, get your finger out. He's, he's sitting in Athens, <laughs> Georgia, uh, and Tom, if you support Mother, give us a Mother point of view. Um, yep. You won't be able to get it in today, so we've got four minutes left, and I'm not going to read it out. <laughs> but nevertheless, <laughs> uh, by the way, the Euro 2028 bid. You know, if it's been submitted, if we were successful for that, Ruffy, um, the matches would take place at Wembley, Villa Park, Everton. The London Stadium, Tottenham Hotspur, Etihad, St James's Park, uh, the Stadium of Light, Old Trafford, the Aviva Arena, Croke Park, uh, the Casement Park in Belfast and Hamden Park and the Principality Stadium. So only one Scottish venue in there. That's not good, is it? No, it's not at all. Uh, I, I'm sure the, the three grounds that spring to mind with us would obviously be Rangers, Celtic Hearts. Uh, I mean, I, I know the, the, the clubs down in England are very, very 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 good but I think we've all experienced the atmosphere at our three grounds and uh, I think the atmosphere would drive on not all of them but quite a lot of these grounds that you've just read out yeah absolutely Um, so uh, the quiz question here's the answer to our quiz which country has the youngest coach at the 2022 World Cup Uh, Tam you want to take a wee uh, guess at this one not a clue oh take a guess at a country Uh, Qatar Guitar. Uh, Costa Rica. Unbelievable. No. Uh, Argentina. Uh, Lionel Scaloni. I think he's early 40s. It's not bad, is it? Um, so he is the youngest. Hopefully he wins it. Well, listen, he would probably be set for life if he could uh, deliver that uh, as well. So. There you have it. Thank you very much to each and every one of you. There's lots of uh, competition prizes coming up shortly with the World Cup on the way. We've got some great goodies to give away. Uh, Ruffy, with our reporters scouring across Europe for the Champions League, they were making sure that they got wee bits of memorabilia. Um, We got, uh, I think we got an Arthur Boric hoodie. We got an Ajax top. We got a Leipzig. Um, We got a Modric Top to give away. Shaq to the Ness. Shaq, no, that I just took that out of my collection. <laughs> <Shaq it. laughs> we've got a we've got a Shaq to the Ness uh, program. Um, Real and Madrid stuff. It, shut it! No, we haven't. <laughs> <laughs> we've uh, <laughs> we've got Modric. I've got Modric's top. So uh, there's lots of goodies, and we're going to be giving away some fantastic World Cup jerseys. Mm. You know what I mean? And uh, we'll also be looking at anyone who wants to get their hands on some of our um, canvas World Cup stars yeah, I think we'll be yeah. giving them away as well so there's lots of fantastic prizes and uh, you'll notice in the next couple of weeks some big things happening at PLZ Soccer uh, so it's unmatched unbiased and of course uncensored as well it's your chance uh, to get an opinion to get involved with us and join the football family by hitting that subscribe button tell your pals as well uh, whether you're living in the UK or uh, quite a few miles away from us uh, overseas 
tell your mates, expats, we'd love to have you join the football family. There are thousands and thousands of people obviously getting on board with us and hopefully you're the next one to hit that subscribe button. And if you download the app, you'll be able to watch the programme on your phone and get all the breaking news stories. It's well worth it. Thanks to Tam, top drawer, to Ruffy, from myself, Peter Martin. Thanks for watching. Come on, Scotland.